Our first speaker, Josh Rosano, he's from the National Center for Science Education. The NCSC is a nonprofit that works with educators, the press, and the public to defend science education in America's public schools. Josh Rosano is a doctoral candidate in ecology and evolutionary biology, and his recent publications include a study of new legal strategies employed by creationists, and also a study of the rhetoric of creationists in the Islamic world. He and other members of the NCSC NCSE recently spent a Saturday with Bill Nye helping him prepare for the now famous debate with uh, Ken Ham that took place on Tuesday. Uh, I think most of us that saw it will agree that Bill Nye was well prepared. Uh, tonight he's going to be telling us about 90 years of fighting creationism from the Science League of America to N NCSE. Uh, everyone join me in welcoming Josh Rosner. Thank you all for coming out on this uh, cold and snowy night. It's my first time here in Moscow, so thank you. It's been uh, great to be here and meet folks and hear about all the cool things that the Coalition of Reason and the different humanist groups are all doing. And I'm excited to tell you a little bit about what we do at the National Center for Science Education and a little bit of the, the weird and wacky history of the creation evolution fight over the years. Uh, for a little bit of background on, on how I got involved in this, I was a grad student in Kansas. I started right after the State Board of Education, well, after a State Board of Education had been voted out of office that had tried to take evolution out of the state science standards. And so when I started, everyone was like, oh, that'll never happen again. We learned our lesson. You know, we're, we're paying attention to the State Board of Education now. They're not going to get reelected. So four years later, creationists got reelected to the State Board of Education, of course. And by then, I was getting to a point in my dissertation where I was realizing I probably shouldn't have gone to grad school. This was not nearly as much fun as I thought. But blogging and, you know, politics, that was actually really interesting. And here it was, politics and evolution, my two interests, were combining perfectly. So I got involved in, in a group called Kansas Citizens for Science, which is a group of citizens who were concerned about the state of science in the schools. Some of them were scientists, teachers, PR professionals, clergy, uh, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot more fun than my dissertation research, which, you know, a valuable lesson learned at that point. And a few years later, a position opened up at the National Center for Science Education, which is the only group dedicated to fighting, solely to dedicating, uh, dedicated to fighting creationism in schools. Now we also deal with climate change because there are a lot of similarities and we can talk about some of the parallels there in the, uh, in the Q&A at the end. And when I started at NCSC, I realized that you know, it just seemed like a totally unique mission for an organization to fight creationism. Where else in the world, when else in history could there have been such a thing? But it turned out that if you went back 90 years, there was another group that was eerily similar to what we are at NCSE now. Um, so the Science League of America was, we're based in Oakland, California, in, in the Bay Area. The Science League of America, start, starting in the 1920s, was based in Sausalito, so just across the bay from us. Their mission was to defend evolution. Ours, at the founding in the 1980s, was to defend evolution. Now we do climate change. We defend teachers in schools when they are under pressure not to teach evolution or when they, if they get fired or if they are uh, disciplined for teaching evolution, we try to support them or if they're teaching creationism, we try to get that to stop. Uh, same, the Science League of America did the same work. We do presentations to state boards of education to try to get evolution into the classrooms and into the standards. The Science League of America did that. Our board includes some of the top scientists in the country. Their board included some of the top scientists in the country. Our mission is to be politically and religiously neutral. Their mission was to be politically and religiously neutral. We have a Eugenie. They had a Eugenie. <laughs> it's just eerie, I'm telling you. Um, some of the differences, we, our general policy is that debates are not a good way to have this, uh, to try to resolve these sorts of issues. It's not a good way to model how science is resolved. It, Scientists tend to do really poorly because they're not prepared for the nature of debate, the, the fact that it's entertainment rather than scientific discourse. Uh, Maynard Shipley, the founder of the Science League of America, did quite a few debates, and I'll talk about some of the ones that he did. Uh, the other big difference is that dues for them were about $3 a year 
whereas ours are about 35, which is still pretty reasonable. And in fact, I did this calculation the other day. If you inflation adjust from the 1925 three dollars, it comes to about forty-one dollars. So membership in NCSE is actually a bargain. I'm just saying, for those of you. Um, so who was this character, Maynard Shipley? That's that's him on the not, not he's not the one in the middle. Uh, he, he's over here, and over on the the far end is I believe oh, I can't see it. I think that's um, Reverend Stratton, who was one of the people he debated. This is a a headline from a newspaper after one of the debates that he did. Photo illustrations in newspapers used to be a lot better. That's awesome. No one does that anymore. So he was, he started out as a shoe salesman in Seattle. He was born in Baltimore, moved out to Seattle uh, as a young man. In his spare time, he was a criminologist. He corresponded with heads of state all over the world, was, uh, became one of the world's experts on the death penalty. Uh, he was mostly self-taught. He attended Stanford for a little while, but he, he wrote, this university life interferes too much with my studies and, and wound up quitting. Not that I'm, you know, I know I'm here in an educational institution and I'm not recommending that path to anyone. I'm just saying it worked for him. And as a, a self-taught science enthusiast, he was one of the, the founders and the president of the Seattle Academy of Science at the time. He, among his many careers, he was also an organizer for the Socialist Party in California and in Washington. He ran a socialist paper in Pullman, I believe, in, no, in Everett, Everett, Washington. Uh, founded the Science League of America, was married three times, including to, to their, that, that era's Eugenie. Um, friend of Jack London, he was almost offered a professorship in comparative law at, the, uh, at Northwestern Law School, which would have been one of the first comparative law positions created. And his, his history with debate goes back before his, his involvement in the creation evolution fight. As, as a socialist organizer, he had debated Emma Goldman on the merits of socialism versus anarchism. The first one he gen is generally agreed that he, he didn't do so well, but after that he realized that debate was more about performance and started thinking strategically about how he, what he would do up on stage during a debate, realized it wasn't just about presenting the facts and letting people understand them, that to win a debate, you actually have to be a better performer, that you have to have the, bring the audience along with you emotionally uh, as well as, as sort of scientifically. He also, so does anyone or recognize who that uh, presidential pin is from? I see a hand up over here. I'll give other people a chance. No? Okay, we got it. That's Eugene V. Jebs. So this is a, a pin from one of his five, I believe, presidential campaigns Obviously, none of them successful. This one, he ran from, uh, from prison. He had been arrested under the Espionage Act for opposing the draft during World War I. So he ran for president from, from prison. Uh, one of the, the lesser known of his political campaigns was uh, he ran for Congress from, in Terre Haute, Indiana, where he, he was born. And Maynard Shipley was actually recruited to be the uh, assistant campaign manager for that. And, Later on, most of the information, I should say, uh, most of the information that we know about Maynard Shipley came from his uh, a biography that his third wife, his widow, wrote. And you have to consider the source for some of the things. So she says that when, he, when Debs visited the Bay Area towards the end of his life, he, he told her, when I am dead and scattered in ashes, every particle of those ashes will say, I love Maynard Shipley. Believe it if you like. I don't know. Uh, he also, upon his death, donated his brain to Cornell Medical School. And so that's his brain, if anyone was wondering what it looked like. They analyzed it and sliced it up and did research on it and published it and the whole thing. So we know what his brain looked like. Uh, he was an author. He wrote, these are most of the titles of the, the, the little blue books that he wrote. This is, again, he, no college education, no high school degree. He wrote about something like 40 books for this, these series called Little Blue Books that were inexpensive, uh, mass market, on a range of topics, anywhere from uh, the, the intelligence of invertebrate animals and also the intelligence of vertebrate animals. Uh, there was, there's one on uh, the Dictionary of Musical Terms, The Truth About the Deluge, where he's talking about creation and the flood. 
The Origin of Life, Darwin Was Right, was one of the titles. So you can see he covered a pretty wide range of, of topics there. He was also a radio host, and there was a, this was the 1920s, right? So before they had movies and, and TV and fun things like that. So at the time when people needed entertainment in the evening, they would go and gather in auditoriums and hear people just talk with slides. And that was how they entertained themselves, which is weird, but you know, that's how things were back then. And he, uh, I have a, his, his radio program on, on NBC, someone said was the best educational feature that any station presents, at least in 1928. He was not, of course, the only person publishing interesting pamphlets at the time. Does anyone recognize, I don't know if you can read that, these are a 12 volume series called The Fundamentals. A, a, a series that gives its name to a movement that we know as fundamentalism. So starting in 1909, these 12 volumes are published. It was uh, commissioned essays edited by a series of, of people, including uh, A.C. Dixon and uh, Tory later, that were trying to codify this, a, a conservative theology that was, was brewing at the time. It was, you have an era there where people were starting to look at the Bible and say, this is a text. We can analyze it the way we analyze the Odyssey and track out, pull apart the different sections that were written by different people and look at this as a document with a history that we can understand and interpret the Bible in that light and, and incorporate that into our theology, into religion. So this religious modernism produced a backlash and a lot of that came together in the fundamentals. And it should be said, of those essays that were written, most of them, of course, don't say anything about evolution, but those that do, some of them were anti-evolution, they just said evolution is wrong. Some of them said this common ancestry idea is, is totally reasonable, of course, that's how God could have done it, but natural selection is wrong because God wouldn't have created using death. There are other people who said, well, obviously natural selection is true, duh, but this common ancestry thing, no, I have a, a problem with that. And there are other people who had no problem at all with the idea of evolution. So there was a surprising amount of, of diversity in, in religious, of, of conservative religious response to evolution in, in these essays starting in the, the 1909. And the A.C. Dixon, who was the first editor, was living in Chicago when he, when he did that, but earlier in his life he lived in Baltimore and he was the, the pastor at the church that Maynard Shipley's family went to. His wife taught Maynard Shipley Sunday School. Whether that has anything to do with the fact that Maynard Shipley became an atheist is an open question. Obviously, during this time, you also have 1925, the Scopes trial, where uh, I'm suddenly stuck with the names of the, the people from Inherit the Wind. Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan, also a, a many-time presidential candidate, squared off in the courtroom over whether John Scopes had taught evolution and whether the state should be allowed to pass a law that would forbid the teaching of evolution. In that instance, you also had this group, the Anti-Evolution League, started in 1924, the same year that the Science League of America was founded. And I like to believe that they had like battles in space with rocket ships and stuff. I don't know. But T.T. Martin and, uh, do I have it in the notes here? Oh yeah, William Bell Riley, who we'll come back to later, were the founders of this organization. Uh, which traveled all over the country promoting these anti-evolution laws and uh, fomenting, fomenting anti-evolution belief wherever they could. And so here's, here's a, a Los Angeles Times front page from, from the day that, the, that John Scopes was convicted. He was guilty of teaching evolution and he was sentenced to a $100 fine, which was ultimately overturned vagaries of the legal system meant that he didn't ever actually have to pay the fine, but they didn't get around to filing the appeal that would have tried to overturn the law itself. And the, the central item there, amid the, the, I think that's an awesome cartoon where you've got the uh, Brian and Darrow squaring off with a, an ape between them saying, when shall we three meet again? And the middle headline suggested that it could have been in California. There was a fight over textbooks, a group of, of conservative pastors, mostly from Southern California, had gotten together and tried to get evolution removed from about 60 textbooks that were approved by the State Board of Education in California. And the state superintendent of public schools said, well, 
in response to the Scopes trial was asked, can evolution be taught? And he said, sure, evolution can be taught in California schools as long as it's taught as a theory and not as a fact, whatever that means. Uh, this is not just ancient history. When Florida revised their science standards in 2009, the old standards did not use the word evolution, the new ones did, and it was great, and it was really exciting, and we were excited to see them passed. And at the last minute, State Board of Education members started getting hinky about it and worried, like, evolution? Are we sure we want to do this? And they resolved the conflict by saying that, by changing the, the wording to say, add scientific theory of in front of every reference to evolution. So it's a strategy that goes back 90 years, but is still uh, in active use. And so, and in Florida, at the same time, there were efforts to, to remove evolution from the schools. Uh, there was a bill in Virginia, or a proposed bill in Virginia that was backed by the, pub, in, in newspaper articles about it, cited the Ku Klux Klan as advocates for the bill. It was an interesting era. And so into that fray, Step Maynard Shipley, at the end of one of the lectures that he was giving in San Francisco, he told people, you know, at the end of this, anyone who's interested in trying to do something about all this crazy stuff that's going on all over the country, come up afterwards and let's talk about what we can create. And so this idea of a Science League of America, a group that would defend evolution in schools, that would fight the fundamentalists wherever they organized. Uh, some of these articles were written by his, his then wife, which probably wouldn't be allowed by newspapers today. And a couple months later, they held the, a, a large inaugural event. So this is Luther Burbank here. Does anyone know that name? Show of hands. I see a few hands going up. Yeah. So Luther Burbank, for those who don't know, was a, a famous plant breeder. He created about 600 different varieties of crop plants, including the variety of potato that McDon is the only one that McDonald's will buy to make french fries with. That's how good he made it, I guess. I don't know. Uh, his birthday is celebrated in California as Arbor Day, as a measure of how important an agronomist he was. So he, the, the newspaper articles at the time, I've got one here. It was the first public appearance that he had in about 15 years. And he got up and said that uh, one might as well oppose gravity or the unreasonable speed of light as combat evolution. Useless waste and unnecessary parasitism take at least nine-tenths of the productive capacity of the United States. And then David Starr Jordan, who's, well, that's Maynard Shipley right there, and then Maynard Star Jordan, David Starr Jordan, who was the uh, chancellor of Stanford University at the time, spoke on the freedom of knowledge, referring to William Jennings Bryan as a man who has never read a bound volume. Maynard Shipley got up and said, uh, reportedly brought down the house by saying, we say to Mr. Bryan, you shall not crucify mankind upon your cross of bigotry. You shall not pray, place your crown of ignorance upon the brow of childhood. This is a reference to Brian's famous cross of gold speech about uh, monetary policy at the 98 convention, 96 convention. Yeah. Historical tidbits. And there were the other, the other folks in the uh, John Barry, who was a journalist, and William Ritter, who was a biologist at Stanford also. So it was a pretty good send-off. They got pretty good coverage in the media and other interest. Yes. And a lot of that same, the Maynard Shipley speech, he reprinted in this uh, newsletter, and uh, which you don't, don't have to and should not try to read. But I think it's interesting to look at, he had, it's a pretty impressive list of uh, board members and advisors that he had signed up early on. Luther Burbank is on there, um, Harold Heath, who's a, you know, a professor at Stanford, David Starr Jordan, a congressman who was one of the people who gave money to create Your Woods Na National Park and who was instrumental in creating the National Park Service, uh, William Kent and a variety of other people. A few years later, the, on the, the side there, you get a, a later version of the letterhead when they had a much more extensive list of, of supporters, including Carl Akeley, who was the chief taxidermist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, who is, for various reasons, a hero of mine, but one of the best reasons is when he was collecting uh, animals in Africa one time, he was attacked by a leopard, 
and managed to work his fist down its throat and choke it to death on his fist and take it back to camp, skin it, mount it. So that's who was backing the, the Science League of America is all I'm saying. And they were publishing pamphlets and, and making, you know, informing the public about what was happening in schools, talking about the war against evolution and the continuing war against the teaching of evolution, calling people to action. Uh, you see some of the, the signatures of those, the luminaries who were supporting, David Starr Jordan is there in the middle, C. Hart Merriam, who was the head of the US Biological Survey, I believe. I'm a I know him as a mammalogist. He was uh, pretty famous in the field. And he continued giving lectures. Uh, this one, for some reason, made headlines that uh, he was saying that anthropoid apes are not so dumb. The apes and man, he's quoted saying, are con constantly growing away from each other, said Shipley, instead of growing into cro closer resemblance as uninformed people think should be the case under evolution. The minds of man and the apes differ only in degree, not in kind. This was news. I don't know. And he did uh, debates. The first one was against a group of Seventh-day Adventist ministers who had originally challenged a, no, no it was, he got roped into it. The, the original people who had agreed to debate these ministers backed out and were like, hey, Maynard, why don't you do this instead? And he, he agreed to it. And he had a little bit of experience with debates from his time with uh, Emma Goldman. The, the result in this case, as you see there, the headline says that it ended in a tie. These photos, by the way, all come from a scrapbook that was donated to the University of North Carolina Library. And it's, there's just cool stuff in there that I, I enjoy looking through. I hope you're enjoying it. You'll tell me at the end if you're not. Um, the, the conclusion of the debate was that the, the judges said that evolution was, was false, but that it should be taught in schools. <laughs> so this is why we don't recommend debates. They're not a great way of getting at the truth necessarily, or even a, a terribly logical result. But Shipley continued to doing them. They were a, a good way to get publicity and to, to raise the, the word. And so I had mentioned W.B. Riley before as the, the founder of the Anti-Evolution League of America. He was also the executive secretary of the uh, World Christian Fundamentals Association, which was the leading fundamentalist organization at the time. And, uh, oops. I left out a page of my notes, so I'm gonna have to do this from memory. Uh, Riley was, is an interesting character. As, as things went along at the World Christian Fundamentals Association, he continued getting more extreme and more radical. Uh, in his later years, he was writing a lot of really anti-Semitic things as well, uh, sort of bl blaming the failure of his anti-evolution crusades on the Jews, basically, <laughs> which is sad and strange. Uh, he, he ran the Northwestern College, not Northwestern University in Chicago, it was a, a Bible college and missionary training center. And his successor there is more famous than he is, a, a young, young evangelist who uh, was known as Billy Graham was a successor there and did not, I believe, share most of those weirder views and didn't really have much to say about evolution through his career. Uh, but they, they debated a couple times in Oakland in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego. And uh, the debates went sort of the way that debates tend to go with people who went in agreeing with Shipley thinking that he won and people who agreed with Riley thinking that he won. When they debated at Biola, as, as it's known now, it, then it was the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, uh, Shipley's comment that the, there were two accounts of creation in Genesis drew jeers and, and uh, mockery from the audience and ultimately he had to sort of shout them down to be able to, to carry on, as you see. He again later on debated uh, William Stratton who was uh, another really vocal evangelical and uh, fundamentalist leader. He originally had been challenged to debate by a medical school professor who at the last minute realized that as a Catholic, he wasn't supposed to debate these issues, so he backed out of the debate and said, hey, Maynard, why don't you take this over instead? And Shipley agreed. Um, at his lectures, he, he liked to say that people will not get any doubts or question marks from my pulpit. Um, no. 
in addition to the debates, Shipley was, uh, there were other fights. This was in Alameda, right across the San Francisco Bay. Darwin's name was proposed, the, the school board wanted to remove Darwin's name from a, a new school building, a new science building. They got involved in the fight. I think the ultimate, the, the school board wanted to replace Darwin's name with uh, Louis Agassiz's name. Agassiz was one of the, the most prominent anti-evolutionists in US politics. Um, or US science, he was a, a major scientist. And uh, in the end, I think the decision was to put neither name on the, tech, on the school building, which is a Pyrrhic victory, perhaps. And, but the, the fight really was, was national. There were about 45 bills filed in 20 states during this period before the, um, before the Great Depression, which really, no one had time for anything else. The Science League pottered on for a few years once the Depression started. The, his wife reports that at one point a member in Nevada paid the dues, the $3 a year dues, uh, by sending in a number of rabbits. I don't believe that NCSE accepts livestock as payment for membership, although no one's ever tried. Just putting the idea out there. Um, but yeah, there was, so there was, it was a national fight. It was certainly a fight in California. There was a bill proposed in, in the state legislature which brought uh, Strat, or Riley back to testify again. As soon as he saw Shipley, he gave, came over and gave him a great big bear hug. Uh, that's a generous portrait of Shipley and a, a generous picture of, of uh, Heisinger, the, the senator who was proposing the bill. And they continued to, they worked with school boards, they worked with teachers, teachers who were fired either at colleges or in secondary schools for teaching evolution. They worked to get them either hired elsewhere or to protect their jobs. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work that, as I look through, as I look through what they were writing, as I look through what they were doing at the time, it's uncannily similar to what we do at NCSE today. Uh, as Steve mentioned, this happened this week. And I, so, how many of you watched it? I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, this is a self-selected crowd, obviously, but I'm curious just how widely it penetrated. There, the Answers in Genesis is claiming that it reached their estimates start out, wow, well, it was about three million people, and then they were saying it was like five million people, and I think they were saying like, it's like seven million people saw it, I don't know. Um, we'll see. But we were really glad to have, I don't know if you can see the, the dot there, but that's Bill in the middle with his bow tie. He, he didn't show up in a bow tie. When we were taking a picture, he had an emergency bow tie with him. <laughs> he can't be seen in public, you know. There can't be photos of him without it. So. So he came and spent a day with us and, and worked to map out strategy. And I'm not telling stories out of school here. He wrote an email to us and said, you know, sh share the word, spread the word. You guys like, came up with the strategy that I used. I was really happy with it. You guys are the reason that I won. I think that he won. I hope that you guys thought so too. Because if you think that he didn't win, then I don't know who this guy in the middle is. He's just some dude. No. Um, so you know, we, we help out with that. If, if he had come to us before he agreed to it, we probably would have said, is there some other way to do this event? Um, but you know, in the last few years, we've fought about 45 bills, or more than, more than 45 bills in uh, probably about 20 states. So similar sort of efforts going on now. To, it's not the same rhetoric. It went from explicit efforts to ban the teaching of evolution that you saw in the, the age of Maynard Shipley to in the, 1960s, or in the 70s and 80s, requirements that if you were gonna teach evolution, you had to give equal time to teaching creationism. For a while, there were, there were efforts to require the teaching of intelligent design in schools before the, the 2005 uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover case. And these days, the laws are a lot more subtle. They're just saying teachers who want to promote critical thinking should be allowed to bring in alternative materials, or especially around controversial topics like evolution, climate change, human cloning. Not a topic, I think, that really gets much time in the high school classroom anyway. But these are not laws that require anyone to do anything, really. But they, um, they open the door. They let teachers who want to do bad things have that opportunity. So these are some of the things that we're working on. I'm happy to talk about more. Um, uh, the main thing I wanted to emphasize here is that we're in, in a long fight here. And it's got a long history, and I think a, a history that we can be proud of, if not, or at least intrigued by. And I hope that, you, I hope that you're in, in as interested in it as I am. I really enjoy thinking about what he was doing and thinking about how we can 
update that and, and bring that into the future. At the, I, I will mention that we do a series of, uh, we're running, a, we've started a series of webinars for people who are interested in activism around science education. So if you go to our website there, ncse.com, you can go to the Taking Action section and sign up to find out more about that and uh, get notices when that's gonna come up. The one we're doing this month is gonna be on how to do outreach to the media. So I hope you'll, you'll check that out. I hope you'll check us out on Twitter and Facebook and check out our blog, which is called the Science League of America, scienceleagueofamerica.org. We'll get you there because we feel like we wanna honor, we wanted to honor that history through the, the name of the blog. We launched that just last year because we're, we're catching up with the technology. We're like mid-2000s mid right now. So thank you very much.